great. We now have uh, the first of the Royal African Society's uh, live online events. I'm delighted to welcome people as you uh, come in. I'm sorry for the slight delay, but we uh, have managed to achieve a good connection to uh, West Africa. And uh, in a minute, I'll hand over to uh, Mohammed Ibn Chambers. Um, I just wanted to say that we do have two other online events already lined up. One next week with Yaki Siliers, the author of Africa First, who uh, will join us from South Africa. And then a panel in uh, two or three weeks time, which we'll send you the details uh, to have a more detailed discussion of the impacts of COVID-19 in Africa, um, and that uh, details will follow. But today, we're very delighted to welcome Mohammed Ibn Chambas, who is currently the Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for West Africa and the Sahel, and the head of the UN's office in West Africa. He uh, is a former president of ECOWAS, and uh, also formerly Secretary General uh, of the ACP and an old friend from uh, my time in Ghana. And I gather you are joining us today from Accra. Uh, that is correct. Chance, no. chance brought you to rest when the world was locked down. But uh, I know you've been following events uh, very closely. Just before we start, I will say we have uh, only half an hour for this meeting, uh, given people's very busy schedule. I know there are several of our attendees who are keen to ask questions, so probably we will have a single round of questions towards the end um, so that we can pack as many in as we can in the time that's available. But um, we'll come to that in due course. Uh, and I would like first, uh, uh, Mohammed, if you could give us a very quick overview of uh, the impacts of the coronavirus pandemic in uh, West Africa and the Sahel, perhaps particularly in the light of uh, the ECOWAS summit meeting that I know you took part in yesterday. So, Mohammed, over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to see you, and I'm happy to participate in this uh, interview of Royal African Society uh, today. And um, let me say that um, the West Africa and Sahel uh, region, for that matter, I have not escaped the dramatic uh, impact um, of coronavirus, COVID-19. And um, it's in that context that the regional leaders deemed it necessary uh, to meet uh, at the summit level yesterday by video conference, I should say, for the first time in the history of the organization. So. Um, the organization is keeping up with the times, and um, it was a very good meeting. Um, all 15 heads of states attended, and I think it's an indication of the seriousness with which they take uh, the challenge posed by COVID-15. And um, I was privileged to represent the uh, UN Secretary General at the meeting. Um, the, uh, AU Commission Chairperson also participated uh, in the meeting. And um, regarding the context in West Africa, I should say that all 15 member states have been affected. That is, at this point, they all have uh, cases uh, of uh, coronavirus infection. And um, indeed, more than 50% uh, of the member states have uh, above 250 cases. Um, and the fatality rate so far in the region has been in the order of 2.5%, which is uh, just about the global average. Uh, so they have not escaped uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, they see it as a very serious uh, uh, pandemic, which is having a multi dimensional effect on so many aspects uh, of, of uh, the, the, the countries. Uh, of course, the immediate health uh, uh, consequences are there, uh, how to cope with this new unknown virus. Um, and uh, the economic impact is immediately uh, being felt uh, across the region. Uh, the social aspect, uh, it is worsening an already quite uh, serious humanitarian crisis in the region, particularly in the Sahel and the Lake Chad uh, Basin area. And um, 
the social consequences, particularly for poor communities, for poor people, uh, the further unemployment that uh, will be triggered by uh, lockdowns and partial lockdowns and the economic downturn that the region is uh, witnessing. Uh, this is, uh, these, these are all obvious uh, consequences, uh, impact uh, that the coronavirus uh, is having on the region. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if I could uh, dig in a little bit deeper because um, you mentioned the Sahel. The Sahel is clearly in face of a quite a serious and, and in some ways growing uh, jihadist threat um, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, uh, challenge from Boko Haram and uh, Izwas uh, in the Lake Chad region, affecting all the countries there. Do you see uh, that situation being exacerbated by the, um, by the coronavirus, uh, the impact of the threat? Um, yes, um, let, me, let me say this, that uh, the root causes of violent extremism and uh, terrorism in the Sahel uh, are multidimensional. But among them are the extreme poverty, climate change, inequalities, uh, neglect of uh, you know, uh, uh, regions and um, uh, uh, bringing about, uh, uh, failure to bring about socioeconomic development, provision of educational health. So, in a context where states are going to face dwindling resources, it means that uh, they will be unable to cope uh, in terms of just providing basic uh, necessities for populations in remote areas. Uh, and this, this is precisely what violent extremists and jihadist groups, uh, terrorist groups, have taken advantage of in the past. And so, to the extent that state capacities to deliver goods and services to the population will be further constrained, to that extent, I think we'll be creating even more opportunities for. Uh, these uh, violent extremist groups. And uh, today, as you have rightly pointed out, some of the most vicious elements of Islamic State are found in the Sahel, with the uh, Islamic State, uh, Greater Sahel, Islamic State, West Africa province, and the uh, Boko Haram, uh, which have no, no limit in terms of the barbarity of their attacks. In fact, one can say that we are seeing opportunistic attacks, taking advantage of coronavirus, ignoring completely the call of the Secretary General. Secretary General Guterres has made an appeal for ceasefire on a globally, all conflict areas, conflict situations, that this is the moment uh, to show some humanity and to cease hostilities so that the global attention can be focused on fighting the COVID-19. Uh, this has not been heeded uh, by the two, by the uh, terrorist groups in Sahel and, and the Boko Haram. And we have seen that they have intensified attacks against uh, security forces and civilians uh, in Niger, in Chad and in Northeast Nigeria. So um, to that extent, I think the, the, the longer uh, this crisis, uh, this health crisis persists, the more it creates opportunities, as Secretary General has said again, for enhanced instability, enhanced unrest, enhanced insecurity. And I think, um, uh, we need to be mindful uh, of, of this consequence also of uh, the pandemic. So, uh, thank you. Would you see increased humanitarian support from the international community as an important part of trying to protect uh, the countries of that region from uh, an escalation in jihadist violence? Uh, absolutely uh, the case, because the Secretary General has already launched 
an appeal for two billion to strengthen our humanitarian interventions in conflict areas, but especially in the Central Sahel and Lake Chad Basin area, where today we are talking of more than uh, a million internally displaced in the Central Sahel zone alone, not to talk of similar numbers that were already there in the Lake Chad Basin area. So as a huge humanitarian crisis and every effort is being made to ensure business continuity on the part of UN humanitarian agencies. And I believe that's the case also of partners, other international partners engaged in humanitarian uh, activity have triggered their business continuity to ensure that we have personnel on the ground, we have staff on the ground, in spite of the constraining conditions in which we are all operating. As a matter of fact, in that context, and I briefed the ECOWAS heads of state about this, that an effort is being made to set up a regional humanitarian hub in Accra as part of an effort by the WHO and the World Food Program to set up these regional hubs. For Africa, there will be one in Accra, another in Addis, in Cairo, and in Johannesburg to ensure that humanitarian supplies uh, are stocked in, in, the, in the quantities that they are required, uh, that the depots are functioning, and that these are able to be transported to IDPs wherever they are in order that support, assistance to IDPs can continue in spite of the restrictions, uh, transport restrictions, air travel restrictions, and also as a component of this to allow for movement of UN humanitarian, but also uh, I will insist again, uh, other partners who are there, international NGOs, other multilateral agencies involved in humanitarian work, that their staff are able to move in the region. So this hub in Accra will also have an air uh, transport facility uh, to be able to move humanitarian uh, uh, staff in and out of locations where they work. And for this, of course, we will need the cooperation, uh, in fact, the full support of the various uh, countries uh, for this to be operational. Well, thank you very much. I want to come back to the international effort in a, in a minute, but uh, I want to look as well at what the African governments themselves uh, need to try and do. Um, because, uh, as we know, many have imposed a lockdown, although we hear that Ghana is just beginning to loosen this. And that has a real uh, heavy impact on society, as, as you say. And you can only really do that if you've got quite a heavy degree of social cohesion and political legitimacy. People will accept, yes, the government uh, wants me to do this, even though there's often a, quite a heavy cost in their, to their personal livelihood. Several West African countries have quite delicate political structures in, in Guinea and Cameroon. Um, how, uh, how do you see those governments reacting? Does it, is it constraining their ability to take the action necessary, or is it perhaps exacerbating some of the domestic problems they have? I think one of the messages that uh, I uh, delivered to the ECHO summit uh, yesterday, and which is the UN position, is that there must be an effort to build wide consensus and an inclusive participatory approach in the implementation of all these restrictions that may indeed uh, be imperative in a situation such as we face. Uh, that means that uh, all of a society approach should be brought to bear. Uh, there should be involvement of traditional authorities, religious leaders, 
uh, women leaders, youth uh, leaders, uh, and, and broad consultation, education, information, communication to carry people along in implementing what is clearly otherwise very harsh measures. People are constrained to close their, their businesses their, and to stay home. And, I mean, these are unusual, these are almost warlike uh, conditions. And indeed, uh, as uh, some have said, we're fighting a war with an unknown enemy. Uh, this is a, a health war, a global health war. So those measures may indeed be necessary, but it's important as much as possible to carry society along. That's one. Two, to avoid measures that seem to be opportunistic in taking political advantage, to score political points, um, because that will, of course, alienate um, sections of the community. Uh, so it's important that these measures uh, are all inclusive and the, there's consultation with political opposition, with civil society, and to carry them along in the adoption and implementation of these measures. Thirdly, it's important to have a human rights approach in the implementation of these measures. The security forces uh, should avoid use of brutal force and arbitrary measures that can alienate the communities. Um, and uh, also in the adoption of these measures, it is crucially important that there's clear transparency in the utilization of state and other resources which have been deployed to tackle uh, the pandemic. Uh, so where uh, clearly corrupt measures are seen to be playing out and people are diverting resources, this can also alienate uh, the communities. So these are some of the measures. Let's involve traditional religious, women leaders, youth leaders, let there be transparency and let there be respect for human rights uh, in the implementation of these harsh measures. And uh, at all costs, let there be accountability and transparency in the distribution of whatever services goods. Sometimes food distributes. Let it not be said that there is some form of discrimination in the distribution of food and other items that may be destined for uh, communities. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to very briefly ask one last question before we turn to some questions, um, and that's about international response. What are the leaders of West Africa looking for by way of um, uh, response internationally? Not necessarily so much just in terms of, of money, though obviously they may be, but uh, perhaps in debt, uh, obviously humanitarian you've mentioned, but uh, economic, if you like, economic context. Yes, um, the Secretary General uh, has joined the call for some kind of a freeze in debt, uh, which I, I should say the G20 responded to favorably by granting such a freeze in debt payment, uh, although it is so far to LDCs. In the context of uh, West Africa, let's uh, be mindful that there are some countries uh, doing very well. We feel that they should not be punished for their success. Countries such as Senegal, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Cap Verde, uh, which are not LDCs and, and therefore did not qualify for the debt relief. So there's a, a broader call uh, for debt freeze. In fact, uh, some have gone further to even talk about a debt cancellation. Uh, for African countries on account of the uh, devastating economic impact that is already being felt and that is uh, likely to continue for some time uh, with collapse of uh, commodity prices, uh, 
uh, disruption of supply chains, and uh, the increasing inflation that will, will be witnessed and the deficits uh, in budgets, et cetera. So uh, the summit uh, called uh, or echoed this call for debt uh, uh, cancellation, but also supported the efforts of the African Union which is trying to mobilize African countries, uh, so to speak, uh, to demonstrate that charity begins at home. So uh, African countries themselves should be seen to be doing, making their best efforts. And that's why a COVID fund, an African COVID fund has been established, uh, for instance, to provide uh, funding to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, uh, the African Center for Disease Control, uh, to support its research in the development of vaccines, uh, mm -hmm. because one yeah. uh, aspect of, uh, of, of the virus is this mutation. So on the African continent, it's likely to have mutated. And so some research needs to be done to make it uh, specific to the African uh, context and environment. Um, and then also the African Development Bank, the regional banks such as the West African Development Bank have all been called upon to mobilize and to see what support they can provide uh, to the different countries which themselves uh, have, have sort of dug deep uh, mm. internally and in trying to uh, put up their best effort in facing and tackling the COVID-19. Great. Well, thank you very much. Let me now turn to some of the um, on, online listeners. And I know uh, we have a question from Pauline Latham, uh, MP. Uh, Pauline, would you just like to introduce yourself and your question? I think we're just trying to find you. Mm. I'm, I'm down as Hetty. Great. We hear you now. Go ahead, please, Hi. Pauline. Um, what I was interested in, um, obviously you've dealt with Ebola, is, it, is this disease seen as, as bad as, worse or better than Ebola? And when we as members of Parliament in the UK were briefed by the Chief Medical Officer originally, this is a long time ago, we were told that once the better weather came and the sunshine came, it was likely to go away. Clearly that isn't the case because it's been in hotter countries and now the UK is based in wonderful sunshine. So I wonder if um, you feel, because you are at the same sort of numbers of people who are dying as the rest of the world, and you don't have such sophisticated health systems in the UK, do you think no matter what people do, you're going to lose that number of people? Or is it something that will, um, peter out because the most vulnerable people die at the beginning and you see that it will peter out once we've gone through that peak of people. Thank you. And um, if I could, before you answer, can I get one more question? There's a question I think from Tom Gilbert, um, who is listening as well. Let's take the two together. Uh, Tom. Uh, if you can't get on, I can read your question, um, which was to uh, thank Mohammed for his presentation and ask uh, how you feel the pastoralist land use conflicts might be affected. As we know, that's a big issue in, in Nigeria, um, but uh, not only in Nigeria. Is the pandemic likely to uh, exacerbate, help? Uh, that kind of situation. Mohammed, over to you. Yes, um, on the first uh, uh, question or questions, because I identified two aspects of the question. The first aspect on Ebola uh, comparisons. Well, first of all, Ebola was already known by the time it hit West Africa. And um, when it hit West Africa, uh, fortunately, it was uh, limited to only the three Mano River Union countries of Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Um, so this 
fact that it was known meant that medically one also knew exactly how to treat it. So perhaps that is one important distinction with uh, uh, COVID-19, which we are all now groping around to exactly you know, know uh, its uh, total uh, dimension and nature and uh, treatment, et cetera. But Ebola had a higher mortality rate or morbidity rate in the sense that uh, almost 50% of those who were infected with Ebola died. So that's how serious Ebola was. And um, in the case of uh, um, COVID-19 so far, as I've said, the global rate is around 2 3%, and that's what is being reflected in, in West Africa. Um, but I think the experience, and this, this emerged yesterday, uh, from the countries which had fought Ebola, saying to the rest of uh, their colleagues, uh, we've had some experiences with dealing with this kind of uh, the, uh, uh, pandemics, or I mean, Ebola was not a pandemic, it was limited to Mano River Union, but this kind of virus. And so we can share some useful lessons. And I think the West Africa Health Organization, uh, which is a regional uh, body, uh, has some responsibility there and was charged to see what were some of the structures that were put in place in these countries uh, to fight Ebola that can be replicated uh, in this fight against COVID-19. So that's uh, on the, now in terms of um, how enduring this can be, uh, let me point out that those who have been uh, affected by COVID-19 at this point are not necessarily the most vulnerable community in this sense that it is it has come from outside and mostly those who have traveled have been the ones who have brought it and it's it's the elite in the society who travel who go abroad and so you will see that so far, the high infection rates have been in the urban communities and among the well-to-do. And this is where we get concerned that if it goes down to the communities, the less deprived, the rural areas, or even urban uh, slums, the peri-urban areas, where social habits of communal living are more profound, it will become difficult to enforce physical distancing. And so that's one of the fears that we have in Africa that if it, it, it goes beyond the urban centers. I mean, if I take, uh, for instance, uh, Accra where, uh, or Ghana, so far it's been in Accra and in Kumasi, two of the largest, they have the largest numbers. And in fact, the overwhelming numbers have been in Accra. And among elites, because the, when you do the tracing, those who have traveled and come back have been within a certain category, upper elite category of the community. Now, let's hope that it can be contained. So the preventive measures are very important. The containment measures are very important because if it goes beyond and starts descending to uh, poorer communities, we can have a, a much uh, difficult and complex challenge. On the impact on the farmers' herder conflicts as commonly known in the region, uh, of course, this is a conflict driven largely by competition over scarce resources. So to the extent that the states are going to be limited in their capacities to provide water and other essential uh, needs for farming communities, even, even inputs as a result of 
supply chain disruptions, uh, fertilizers and other basic commodities for farming communities will now be disrupted. And uh, restrictions in transportation and movement also will have severe consequences on agriculture and food production uh, systems. And I can then see that in that kind of context, one can expect higher, not less, um, conflict over resources, which has been at the root. The root has been a root cause of farmer header conflicts. Of course, there's the aspect of climate change, uh, which should also not be and, uh, 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 forgotten. Thank you. Well, th thanks very much. And I think uh, if we have time, one last question from Alonso Soto, um, who I hope is uh, online. Um, if you are free to give your question orally, Alonso. Hello. Uh, you should be able to talk now. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, Sounds right. you're on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Shambas, um, you, you mentioned the risk of uh, jihadists taking advantage of this. You also mentioned the, the economic fallout of the pandemic. Uh, I wanted to ask you if there is a concern that uh, a, a severe decrease in revenue for a lot of these countries like Nigeria and Chad could compromise their defense capabilities at this time and also the displacement of troops to comply with lockdowns. If that could be a risk and you guys are concerned about that. Thank you. Mohammed. Yes, um, indeed. Um, I did uh, point out that we are seeing uh, heightened uh, uh, activity on the part of the violent extremists and terrorist groups in both Central Sudan, that's uh, what is sometimes called the Litako Buma area, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger uh, access, but also on the part of Boko Haram in the Le Chad area uh, uh, during this crisis, the uh, COVID-19 crisis, we have seen the most vicious attack by Boko Haram against Chadian troops, the one that led to almost 100 troops uh, being killed. And um, of course, uh, the repose to that, we also know, was uh, one which was very uh, vigorous on the part of the Chadian forces, uh, which uh, managed to uh, push out Boko Haram from, from many of the islands uh, in the Lake Chad. But you see, this has to be sustained. This effort has to be sustained. That means more resources need to be put into the security effort uh, on the part of different member states, but also on the part of the G Sensor Health Force, the new force, which is uh, still being stood up um, and which needs to be given all the wherewithal that it needs to face a very vicious uh, terrorist groups uh, such as the Islamic State in Greater Sahara. On the Lake Chad side, it means that the multinational uh, uh, force, joint force, uh, also needs to be given more capabilities and more support. Um, and at a time when we're talking of limited uh, or at least dwindling resources for the state, which also has to be mindful of providing for socioeconomic needs of the population. So that balancing act is already at play, uh, how to ensure that adequate resources are provided security forces in this legitimate fight against terrorism, while at the same time making sure that education and health and water and other uh, basic needs of uh, communities in these areas are not forgotten because uh, again, the root causes go back to the marginalization and the lack of development, the poverty, uh, lack of opportunity for women, young girls and youth. Uh, so we need to uh, more or less uh, at, at this point, 
uh, do a balancing act, vigorous fight against uh, COVID-19, at the same time that we maintain vigilance and a very vigorous uh, fight against uh, violent extremism and terrorism, while not uh, forgetting to provide uh, for marginal communities, um, poor communities, and vulnerable communities in the face of this uh, pandemic. Mohammed, thank you very much, and thank you so much for giving us uh, uh, such a lot of time in the middle of this crisis. I, I know your comments will have been of real interest to our audience um, out there today, who, and I'm very grateful to all of them for joining us. And I think some of your messages are very important, that we need to carry away the importance of sustaining the uh, humanitarian impact of the international community, joining the African efforts to deal with this, but the governments themselves getting their act together engaging with civil society, I think a very important message, and making them an integral part of the efforts to uh, tackle the crisis in order to um, minimize the, the, the social and uh, economic downside. So thank you very much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to see you again. We send you all our best wishes for staying well and continuing uh, the work in uh, West Africa. And uh, I hope uh, the time will come when our paths can cross physically as well as virtually again. It's so always a thanks. pleasure, Nick. For me to say thank you, it's always a pleasure. And uh, you see that uh, COVID-19 is not creating any uh, distance between us. And I'm, I'm happy that we've been able to uh, have this interview. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon. You stay safe and all our participants uh, be safe. And also, once again, Nick, uh, my best regards to your mom. We wish her very well. Thank you very Bye -bye. much, Mohammed. And the very best to your family too. All right. Thank you very much to everybody. And uh, those who missed it will be able to watch it online. Thanks so much. And bye for now. Thank you.